we have lots of ground to cover tonight, I mean, almost the whole world. Um, and um, we'll get going um, immediately um, because we have up here on the panel, we would have about 35, 40 minutes of um, discussion and then we would be more than happy to hand it over to you, to your questions and comments so that we can enjoy a hopefully lively discussion. And um, to get started, let me, put, let me try to put um, a little frame around um, our issue tonight. So, almost four years ago, four years already, during the Ukraine crisis, Russia broke out of the post-Cold War system, a system of Western-dominated security, the Russian leadership, had defined, defied as code, peace, um, and principle right from the beginning. Seeing itself as a reborn great power, Putin's Russia is entering a new era. Post-West is the new buzzword, um, describing the beginning or continuation of an era of intense competition between Russia and the West might be even more than competition, estrangement, and confrontation even. Deep mistrust is reigning on both sides. Long gone the so-called romantic times of a summit um, uh, President um, George W. Bush uh, hosted for Vladimir Putin in November 2001 in Crawford in the so-called Southern White House. A wonderful evening, um, fireplace, uh, Condi Rice played the piano, there were lessons in traditional folk dancing for the Russian president. Um, George W. Bush invited Putin to come back in summer to enjoy a jog in the uh, gruesome Texas summer heat, um, Vladimir Putin, who knew exactly how much um, George W. Bush, the, the American president, hated the cold. He invited him um, for a, a winter splash in Siberia. Everything was wonderful. <laughs> These guys looked into each other's soul. I mean, it seems like long, long, long gone history, doesn't it? Today, the Kremlin is de facto operating in a war mode. Putin is popular in his own country as a de facto wartime national leader, defending the principle of sovereignty um, and accompanied by an intense media and propaganda campaign, many Russians seem to live physically and psychologically in the state of a besieged fortress where enemies Western enemies are barbarians at the gate. On the other side of the Atlantic, ladies and gentlemen, things does, do, do not look really better now. Russia's hope for a certain, let's put it this way, reset and a probable deal with US President Trump on Ukraine and sanctions and maybe fears of interest did not materialize, at least um, not so, so far <coughs> not. On the contrary, Trump's policies of threat, threats of unpredictability, of chaos, of blatant, excuse me, ignorance, divide, and even a further strategic retreat from the role of global leadership are a serious test for everybody, for the stability of the international order. In this sense, the strategy of America first, whatever this may be, um, is just another word for Yes, for post-West. Stuck in between are we, Europeans. Caught in the middle, Europe, the European Union, so far at least, um, struggles or is battling with its own identity crisis. Uh, French President Emmanuel Macron is looking for democratic heroes and for other heroes in Germany to bring to life um, his European vision more and more EU members seem to turn their back on the fundamental rules, set of rules and value that define the European Union. The buzzword here is illiberal democracies. So far, there seems to be only one winner in this game, um, if we might call it a game, it's China. So are we really witnessing an era, beginning of an era post-West? What would be the implications 
of such a new multipolar order, or is everything just overestimated? What are the risks and real dangers of this new adversarial relationship between Russia and the United States? We are talking about a nuclear arms race again. Or are there um, still fields of cooperation, maybe even strate new strategic openings? And while all, is dangerous and while all this is dangerous and challenging for Europe, could this crisis hold certain chances for Europe? Um, will Europe finally get its act together um, and formulate a new policy towards Eastern Europe, towards Russia, maybe an even new Ostpolitik Germany was so famous for for many, many years? So tonight we are in the very privileged position, ladies and gentlemen, to have three distinguished experts in the field of international and security politics, each of them full of experience and very deep understanding of structures and each other's countries. And they are here to answer all these questions and hopefully define some new common ground or way even into the future. Each of them is I might put it this way, a personalized confidence building measure. <laughs> so we are really honored and happy to welcome, first of all, Andrei Kortunov. I do it in an alphabetical order. Um, Andrei Vadimovich is the Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council, a think tank founded a couple of years ago with a mission to facilitate Russia's peaceful integration into the global community, correct? That's a big task, Andrea. Yeah? Um, and he sees himself and in the Institute as independent researchers. He is not Putin's voice. Having studied and worked at the famous Institute of USA and Canada, he describes the Ukrainian crisis as a turning point in his life as a researcher. I understood, he said once, that we have to do something. We are, you, we, meaning Russians, we are Europeans. Moscow is so close to London and Berlin. There's Wolfgang Ischinger, Ambassador Ischinger, one of Germany's finest diplomats, professor at the Hertie School of Governance, and of course, chairman of the Munich Security Conference, a bridge builder par excellence. Everybody knows him. He knows everybody, and everybody who does not know him wants to know him. <coughs> So he looks with lots of anxiousness, if I might say so, especially in the Western direction towards Washington, um, where he sees uh, Trump um, betraying the trust of many political leaders also in Germany, and he fears further isolation of the United States and the world community. And then, of course, we have Andrew Weiss, one of the finest experts on U.S.-Russian relations in the United States. He's the vice president at the renowned Carnegie Center, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, responsible for Russia and Eurasia research. You have been serving, Andrew, as a director for Russian, Ukrainian and Eurasian affairs within the National Security Council as well under Presidents um, Clinton and uh, Bush. So he knows how the political machine in Washington um, and in the United States uh, works. So again, a warm welcome to our participants. Thank you so much that you made it over the ocean, that you made it through the new um, uh, Iron Curtain, Andre, and that you made it, uh, Wolfgang <laughs> from Berlin to um, the independent state of Bavaria. So let's um, start right away, maybe with uh, Andre, with Mr. Kortunov. Um, we have seen a spectacular geopolitical comeback of Russia's president, of uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, his stand on sovereignty and a new balance of power in the world is challenging the Western or the international um, community. Um, can you put this comeback in the context of the primary foreign policy um, objectives of the Russian presidents? In other words, describe to us how the mood in Moscow is these days. Victory or maybe even insecurity as well. 
Well, okay, first of all, thank you. I'm very glad that I have a chance to be here in this beautiful city of Munich uh, and to address uh, this audience. I never miss an opportunity to get back uh, to Munich. And of course, uh, thanks to Wolgan, I can uh, do it practically every year, <laughs> which I'm very happy for. But let me start with saying that um, if I were to compare Russia today to a financial institution, I would say that Russia resembles uh, an aggressive growth investment fund. Uh, over the last couple of years, we saw Russia appropriating assets all over the place. Not just uh, close to its borders, not just in its periphery, but also in the Middle East, also in Southeast Asia, also in Latin America. And we have a very mixed package. On the one hand, uh, we can say that uh, some of the investments so far turned out to be quite successful. For example, the Russian operation in Syria can be compared to a very successful startup because with a relatively small investment in blood and treasure, Russia was able to turn itself into a major player in the region, from which it almost disappeared earlier, as we all recall. Five, seven years ago, Russia was considered to be you know, just a you know, pale shadow of the former Soviet Union that had uh, no chances of playing any significant role uh, in the Middle East. And there are other arguably successful investments that uh, Mr. Putin has made over the last couple of years. However, I think that we have problems with this portfolio. And let me just limit myself to three problems which I consider to be most evident. Uh, first of all, a part of these investments are very risky. You can call them speculations. Look at the relations between Russia and Venezuela. Russia recently once again restructured the debt of Venezuela to Moscow and uh, provided uh, the leadership of this country with another multi-billion credit. So it is, e it is easy to imagine that uh, the situation in Venezuela might change quite dramatically and that would be a net loss for the country. <laughs> and that is definitely not the only case we can talk about. Another important problem which I see is that even if you have a successful investment, you should think about exit strategy. You should sell your stocks when the price is high. And if you take Syria, the price might be high today, but whether it stays high tomorrow. Because Russia and its partners in this coalition, Iran and Turkey and some others, can arguably win the war, which is still an open question. And not everybody agrees that the war can be won. But even if they win the war, will they win the peace? And the history of Russia knows many cases when Russia was able to exercise a lot of influence during the wartime. Look at the Balkans, look, you know, Balkans of the 19th century. Most of the countries liberated by Russia from the Ottoman yoke gravitated to this country, to Germany, and for good reasons. Because Russia, the Russian Empire at that stage, was able to win the war, but it was not able to win the peace. And finally, I think, what is the problem that Russia has? The final problem is that the number of investment mechanisms that the country has at its possession is very limited. You know, Russia can definitely capitalize on its special status in the international system as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, which it, it is probably abuses from time to time. Russia has a formidable military capacity, not just the nuclear, but we see the power projection capacity of Russia is second only to the United States, arguably, today. <coughs> Russia has major resources, including energy and others, but is it really enough for a country like Russia to maintain its status in the 21st century? It is an open question. So I think that uh, Putin should be concerned 
about he can how he can convert these very risky investments or even speculations into something more stable, more reliable, uh, something uh, that would give uh, Russia a lasting influence and a legitimate place in the international system. And that can be done only if Russia is able to cut a deal with its major partners or opponents. So we might, Andrew, consider the Russian investment in the startup called Trump in administration as a speculation, um, maybe. <laughs> um, and the question to you coming from Washington, just um, I have two very simple um, questions. First, the first one would be, what is the Russia strategy of President Trump? <laughs> the second one um, would be, is there any proof for the Russian meddling and interference in the election campaign of last year, or is it just only anti-Russian hysteria and an or orchestrated media campaign, as many Russians would argue? Well, uh, very good questions, and first of all, let me just extend my appreciation for being included in this terrific session tonight, and my uh, thanks to the sponsors. Um, we are, in the U.S., looking at a period of considerable dysfunction and incoherence in our foreign policy as a result of how Mr. Trump has organized his team, how he uh, organizes his own activities with uh, constant sort of public drama, and I think a sort of inability to stay disciplined or focused. Um, that set of factors are not going to change. So I think we should basically assume that the level of incoherence, contradiction, um, and dysfunction are going to be the norm. And you see a hollowing out of institutions that used to be very central to how the U.S. organized or executed its foreign policy, most obviously the State Department, which has suffered uh, tremendously under, under Mr. Trump. So uh, I'm not expecting as you say, there would be a policy on many issues. I'm expecting there to be policies, plural, on issues. And so you'll see a level of either uh, dis disagreement between the core national security bureaucracy and the president himself, which is the case on Russia, where the, the I'd say the most average uh, and senior people around Mr. Trump have very uh, jaundiced or very skeptical views about what's possible with Russia and a sort of outlier position embraced by Trump, who again over the weekend in this very, uh, I think, uh, clumsy way talked about not only trusting Putin over the intelligence uh, community, but also overstating how important Russia is as a potential partner. And he used this kind of very flamboyant language about how millions of people could die if we don't cooperate with Russia. And so he just keeps using language that seems really out of sync with where mainstream Republican or Democratic party thinking is on these issues and where the core practitioners, the people you rely on to implement policy, formulate a policy, are coming from. And you touched on this in your beginning comments, your introductory comments about the level of mistrust. And I think it's a, it's a really important point that people don't focus on enough, which is that basic trust does not exist anymore between the United States leadership and the Russian leadership. Um, and it's practically impossible to do the big things that Donald Trump claims he wants to do um, in the absence of dialogue. Channels of communication have basically totally broken down and are now at levels not seen since the worst days of the Cold War. We have a new ambassador in Moscow, Ambassador Huntsman, um, who's an independent political figure in his own right as a former presidential aspirant. And so we'll see if he's able to build channels of communication, but there are structural reasons why that's going to be very hard, both because of the mistrust, but also because the locus of decision-making in Russia on foreign policy issues is so uh, centralized and personalized, and the people who make those decisions are generally not accessible to Americans. They don't seek a dialogue with the United States. They don't cultivate those kinds of connections. So there's a foreign ministry which plays the role of carrying messages back and forth between the West and these decision makers. But um, as we've seen even over the weekend, uh, doing things at the presidential level remains very challenging. 
on the second question you asked about, is there a there there in all these allegations? I think there's no doubt that there is very much a there there. And that we've seen a pattern of behavior that goes back many years, not just in the United States, but in Russia's neighborhood, in this country, and other parts of Western Europe, of what looks like fairly flamboyant, not terribly subtle, not terribly covert attempts to use existing problems in the Western uh, industrialized world uh, to create wedges, to create tensions inside society, um, and to create a level of dysfunction. And I think ultimately, if you think about what the Russians' core agenda was during the US presidential election, it was to create a sense of chaos and of despair about American democracy and to basically discredit our democratic system and to be able to point to it as being nothing better or distinguishable from what Russia has today. And so I think that was an abiding purpose. And Mr. Trump has kind of this disruptive force who tried to say that the system is rigged and that the election outcome is not legitimate was a wonderful vessel for that kind of message. On top of that, and then I'll, I'll conclude, you know, it comes back to the original point about is there a policy, was this fixation that Trump had on uh, Mr. Putin, but also on the idea that Russia was so important to US foreign policy goals. And it's very hard, I mean, even at this late stage and even after this weekend's performance, to come up with a practical set of policy reasons for talking like that. And the only one that I can come up with, and you see this in some of the revelations of secret meetings and secret contacts between members of the Trump entourage and uh, the Russian government, was this obsession that Russia could somehow help the United States in Syria, Russia could somehow help the United States isolate and contain China, and Russia could somehow be pulled away from Iran. And that if we did things that were nice, like relax the sanctions or re-establish a normal uh, relationship with Russia, um, that all could happen. And I think that there's a fundamental level of either magical thinking or unreality about all of that. But that was, to the extent there was any rationale, that was what they were aiming at. So you're trying to find small islands of rationality in, an, in a stormy ocean of, uh, of another world. Um, basic trust does not exist anymore between Russia and the United States, you, you state. Um, sounds even worse than the Cold War, um, Ambassador Ishinga, or is that too much? of pessimism when it comes to basic trust and maybe basic trust between Russia and uh, Germany. Well, I, uh, I think it's, uh, it's very difficult and probably impossible to compare the present uh, with the era of the Cold War. The, the, the fundamental conditions were substantially different. Um, yes, uh, there was during uh, important periods of the Cold War a certain substance of trust bilateral between the Soviet leadership and uh, US leadership uh, and certainly in the context of Ostpolitik uh, in our relationship. But the fundamentals uh, were so different. Uh, there were certain things that simply you know, were taken for granted, like uh, mutual assured destruction and uh, Soviet forces in Germany, uh, hundreds of thousands of them, and uh, huge numbers of American forces on this side uh, of the um, dividing line of the Iron Curtain. Um, but I would, uh, I, I would agree with those who argue that the current situation, while should not be compared to the Cold War, is uh, probably uh, the single most risk-laden period that we have experienced since the end of the Cold War. Uh, because of the significant loss of most, if not all, trust, certainly because of the things that we've just been discussing between Washington and uh, Moscow, it's very difficult to see how that, given the congressional uh, uh, positions, etc., etc., how there could be at any 
any moment in the near future, how could, there could be a resumption of a more normal um, uh, uh, dialogue. I think what we have at the moment, we as European onlookers looking at, at Moscow and at Washington, we have two leaders who for different reasons um, are seen as unpredictable. Putin, uh, because he uses unpredictability as an instrument, he's very smart, sometimes he's not unpredictable, sometimes he is. And Trump, because he believes unpredictability is his unique selling point, the, the way he has become He's become a successful deal maker by making his uh, uh, his uh, opposite numbers uh, 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 unsure of themselves and and uh, sort of um, you know unpredictability as a uh, as a fundamental approach to deal making. I happen to believe, on the basis of my own diplomatic experience, that that is actually not a good recipe. It may be it may be a good recipe in real estate in New York or in Palm Beach. Uh, I think in diplomacy, in diplomacy, you tend to meet twice or actually several times in life. And if you have been uh, dealt a miserable hand once, you're not going to trust that other person uh, the next time around. So. In diplomacy, maybe more than in most uh, normal business relationships, trust is essential. In the absence of trust, very little can be achieved. Point one. Point two. Um, I think that you know, for a practicing diplomat, I'm not a historian. I'm not a prof well. I do teach a little bit, but I'm not by profession uh, uh, um, an academic. I'm by profession a practicing diplomat. So for me, the question is, what do we do now? What are we supposed to do? Does anyone have a good recipe? Good question. Uh, good question. And I think that what I would propose also for our discussion is that we differentiate a little bit between the short term and the longer term. Uh, it is possible for me to dream about what might be possible, you know, some years down the road uh, in a post-Trump and maybe even a post-Putin era. None of these leaders are going to be there forever. Uh, there will be changes. There have always been uh, changes, always been around. But in the short term, which means this year, next year, in the immediate future, I think our goal has to be, uh, you know, as they say in golf, you have to keep your eye on the ball. And um, uh, what this means, uh, in, in security and foreign policy at this moment is we have to make sure that things will not get worse. Uh, we have little hope of being able to push a reset button and make all the troubles go away in the short term. But we may have an opportunity to make sure that things will not get worse. And I, I, I just want to, while I have the floor, I would just like to uh, point to one specific area where things could actually get, uh, start getting a lot worse for maybe for Americans and, and Russians, but also and in particular for us here in Europe. What I'm talking about is, and this is just an example, is the fabled INF Treaty. Mm -hmm. You know all about it, uh, Andre. <laughs> the INF <clears throat> Treaty, which was the result of long years of negotiation, and uh, huge demonstrations in Bonn, 300,000 students uh, on the streets in 1983. And at the end of the day, it was possible to eliminate this particular category of nuclear weapons, intermediate range. At the moment, important voices in the United States, including the Trump administration, uh, believe that Russia is violating uh, this treaty. Uh, the folks that I speak to in the German government believe that the Americans have a point. Um, Russians, of course, are saying that it is the Americans who are doing stuff which is actually in violation of the um, spirit and the philosophy mm. and the treaty because of 
ballistic missile developments, etc., etc. So both sides have mm. complaints. If these complaints uh, in diplomacy, you, all, you always have to start from the worst case, right? So the worst mm. case would be the treaty starts to unravel, and if one one of these two sides pulls out of the treaty. The next thing that could happen, I'm not saying it, it would happen, but the next thing which could happen is that uh, somebody might suggest that the necessary response here in Europe would be, could be, given Putin's unpredictability, etc., etc., could be the deployment of new nuclear weapons in Europe. And this is what, where I mean things could really get worse, politically speaking. I do, I do not foresee much pleasure for European politicians and political leaders explaining to their electorate that we're going to have a need to deploy new nuclear weapons because the Trump administration or somebody from Washington believes that that is necessary. I think all hell would break loose and we would have an, an even much greater um, problem between Western Europe and the United States, uh, if that were to become a real issue. We are actually not so far away from it. So I think that uh, for the short term, we need to make sure that that's not going to happen. Uh, if we want to make sure that that's not going to happen, the United States and Russia must find at least in this specific, specific area of military to military, of arms control uh, issues, a way to start talking to each other. Uh, and we Europeans need to talk to them in all seriousness. Uh, and we need to insist that they cannot, over our heads, uh, uh, abandon what was agreed uh, 20 years ago. So, uh, but this is just one example where I think, you know, things are really not good and potentially could even get worse. So once we got there already, new nuclear arms race question mark, um, Andrew and André, um, is Ambassador, Ambassador Ischinger right? Of course he is, but maybe you have to. Uh, you can add your, your perspective, the perspective from Washington, new nuclear arms race, um, started under the Obama administration already. Um, criticizing Russia for violating the INF Treaty, even <coughs> producing new uh, mid-range missiles. Um, President Putin, um, on the other hand, Andrei, in Valdai, he committed, I think, half of his speech to the whole nuclear questions and uh, from people who apparently know um, how his speech um, was um, written, um, they claim that Putin himself personally um, wrote this second half of the speech um, concerning nuclear weapons and a problem nuclear arms race. So this is really serious, is it? Andrew, maybe you start? So I've, I've been toying whether to tell one of these bad Russian jokes, but I guess I have to tell it, which is the, you know, the Russian version of what's the difference between the optimist and the pessimist. And the pessimist says it can't get any worse. The optimist says, sure it can. So it's, you know, it, it very much tracks what Ambassador Ischinger was just saying. Um, and you know, we have a, a real mess. And we have an administration in power in Washington, which does not, generally speaking, think arms control is a uh, appropriate uh, priority for its defense. Uh, uh, planning and goals in the world. And so there are segments inside the Trump administration which would be happy to walk away from the INF Treaty because they have other goals and other systems they seek to develop um, separate and apart from the question of what Moscow has done in terms of violating the treaty. And there's a tension building up in Washington, I think, about whether uh, the U.S. should walk away because of those uh, views inside the administration or what I would think is the more sensible approach is basically hang on to the treaty and keep as much pressure and as much unity between the United States and the Europeans as possible on Moscow to come back into compliance and to find ways to do that. Um, 
which side of this debate will prevail is completely unclear and it comes back to the point I made earlier about messiness and incoherence. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very hard. Um, Congress has a role to play here um, and they've so far done that I think pretty capably in terms of boxing in the Trump administration but we'll see on this issue it's more it's, it's more complicated it's less black and white. Um, as far as our ability to do arms control um, and I'll let maybe Andre speak to this, there are very strong Russian views about missile defense and what are known as advanced strategic conventional systems, mm -hmm. which are basically systems that can be used at uh, supersonic speed to deliver conventional warheads to a very, very specific set of targets. And on the Russian side, there's fears that combined with more ambitious U.S. missile defense deployments, such systems could have a nullifying effect on their strategic deterrent. Mm -hmm. So there's huge questions right now about strategic stability that are coming into play. And if you throw into that questions about cyber and the disruptive effects that cyber can have on strategic command and control systems, on uh, parts of critical infrastructure, and creating both uh, chaos and uncertainty um, in leadership circles and moments of crisis, you're looking at a very messy situation. So when Ambassador Schroeder says, we need to do everything we can to keep things from getting worse, I completely agree. Um, there's been one tentative step in the last six to eight weeks, which was to resume a dialogue between the United States and Russia on what's called strategic stability. It's so far being done at a very low level, and it's being done uh, in a bit of a policy vacuum because the administration hasn't completed reviewing its policies on nuclear weapons, on the INF Treaty and other issues. Um, so all this will take time for the team in Washington to kind of get its act together to be able to have a coherent conversation. Um, I'm not expecting that much to come out of it, but it's one of those situations where you want to get caught trying as opposed to uh, sitting on your hands and just complaining. A strategic dialogue, Andre. Is this well, is a tiny chance? <clears throat> Or should Chancellor Merkel go first to Washington, then to Moscow? Well, first of all, you know, I, I think that indeed, you know, unfortunately, things can get worse. I agree. I agree that they can worse can get worse in many ways, and uh, INF is one of them. Uh, but let me also say that uh, we cannot limit ourselves to uh, trying to preserve what we have, because the world and the technologies will not wait. Uh, if you take arms control of the 20th century, it was like, you know, basic arithmetic. Right now we have to apply high mathematics because in many cases mobility is more important than quantity of weapons. Precision is more important than the throw weight. And there are many new types of weapons that have never been covered by any arms control agreements. Uh, so it's not good enough to restore what we had, and sometimes it is impossible to restore. We cannot restore INF, we cannot restore CFE treaty on conventional <coughs> weapons in Europe, because the technologies are very different from what they were, even if we had all the goodwill on all the sides. If you take specifically the issue of INF, you know, I tend to support the idea that uh, we should merge INF and uh, New START. Mm -hmm. We should, because in the United States they are very concerned uh, about Russian tactical weapons, and here in Germany they also have reasons to be concerned about tactical nukes on the Russian side. Uh, we might be concerned about particular types of strategic weapons or about global prompt strike capacity, which might be reality at some point. So let us have a cocktail mm -hmm. of nuclear forces and each of the sides uh, will mix this cocktail to its liking. Uh, it might even involve uh, some BMD capacities if we mm -hmm. demonstrate certain imagination. I understand that it is uh, sounding like a fantasy, but I think that on top of preserving, which I would uh, underscore once again is important, we have to offer a vision, a vision that it's not just about maintaining this you know, p pretty poor status quo uh, with uh, the logic and the 
mentality which goes back to mid-20th century. We should move ahead. And I think it also means that we should explain to our societies the gravity of the problem. Because I don't know about the United States, I assume that it is probably also the case in America, but in Russia, uh, the public uh, takes a very, I would say, light attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not the case during the Cold War. I am old enough to remember how people were concerned. I mean, ordinary people in the streets of Moscow or Leningrad or wherever they are, they were really concerned about the danger of the nuclear war. I don't see this concern today. It's almost like, you know, fun. It's almost like a Hollywood blockbuster about the end of the world. Okay, well, you know, it, it might be thrilling, but people forget about that the, the, the moment they, they, they get out uh, 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 from, uh, from, the, uh, from the cinema. Uh, so I think that uh, this is also something that we have to keep in mind, because unless there is public pressure, it will be very difficult to overcome the inertia of the political thinking on both sides. <clears throat> So maybe before we open it to the floor, um, one question that might be an, uh, an island of possible cooperation, um, which is Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. An um, island of island of stability, <laughs> of stability no, 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 in the no, no, center no, of Europe. No, no, no. It Vacuum. might be an Vacuum. island of possible <laughs> cooperation. You know, a bit, I mean, it might be. Um, you, 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 you guys have, have the answer. But if we look for say, at uh, Russia's foreign policy, um, the the one of the most one of the biggest challenges for western policymakers boils down to moscow's desire to um, have the western recognition of the fear of sphere of influence in the post soviet states especially when it comes um, to ukraine um, so why not start working on this and building new trust trying to find fields of Re realpolitisch, real policy, common ground. Um, I look at you, Andrew, because um, the special representative of the United States government is negotiating, apparently, um, the delivery of so-called lethal defense weapons to Ukraine. Also not a very good idea, is it? So, uh, when you say you think that we can start with Ukraine, and I, I do think that from a, just from a, a practical standpoint, it is impossible to imagine any circumstances in which the U.S.-Russian relationship significantly uh, stabilizes in the absence of some form of political solution in Ukraine. I don't see the road at all mm -hmm. to getting it. Um, mm -hmm. And so reasons are, one, that what Russia has done is basically conduct an undeclared war against Ukraine now for going on almost four years. And tens of thousands of people have died. There are two million IDPs in Ukraine. This is a big, uh, still very hot conflict. And people have this idea that the war is basically over, but the forces are in very close proximity to each other, and there's any number of ways you can imagine a spike in the fighting at any point. Um, so we're walking by the graveyard and taking for granted a level of stability there that doesn't, uh, doesn't exist. Second is that what Moscow, I think, is hoping for, and it's always been a big mystery, what does Putin want, what is he trying to achieve in Ukraine, there aren't really good answers to that. But there is, I think, a sense among some that the Russian leadership believes that either, at a minimum, Ukraine will remain this kind of messy country that's so... Uh, dysfunctional and such a uh, corrupt uh, and cronyistic society that the West will want nothing to do with it and basically it will never be able to fully integrate and become part of the fabric of European nations. But there's also, I think, a sense, and it's misguided probably, but a real, I think a very real sense in, in Moscow that at some point this thing will just crater and it will seek a more normal modus vivendi with Moscow. And there's this kind of expectation that Ukraine is hanging by a thread and Mr. Poroshenko one day may just be out of office and there'll be someone replacing him who will be willing to cut a deal. Mm -hmm. I think what Moscow has actually got, and this is, comes back to bigger questions about is Putin a grand strategist and has he you know, got these big strategic goals that he's uh, 
executing on, or is he more of a person who's made some really pressurized tactical moves that have ultimately uh, redounded uh, long-term to Russia's disadvantage? But in the case of Ukraine, he's basically taken a country which was Russia's you know, long time, one of its closest, most connect, interconnected societies, and he's created an enemy at his doorstep. And for generations to come, there will be a sense of Ukrainian nationalism and national identity that's inherently anti-Russian and that views Russia with great, great suspicion or hostility. So that is going to be, a, you know, to me, a cocktail that makes what you referred to a minute ago as the mission of the U.S. Uh, peace envoy, uh, Kurt Volker, who's a very talented former career diplomat, so challenging because what he's trying to do is find some ways to de-escalate the crisis, to find possible opportunities Putin has put out there for some form of international force that might come in and help stabilize the situation. All of that is up against a political calendar, which is horrible, because Russia is entering its presidential electoral cycle. There will be elections on March 18th uh, for president. Even though the outcome is not in doubt, the process is very important. And then Ukraine will go into cycle, and there will be parliamentary and presidential elections in 2019. So the idea that there will be any great deal, especially a deal that involves uh, a serious compromise, particularly on the Ukrainian side, under these conditions, to me, seems really unlikely. And so the debate about whether the U.S. should sell weapons or give weapons to Ukraine, to me, seems very secondary to those bigger political challenges. Andre, so no, no big deal, no great deal well, when you it know, comes for, to Ukraine? First of all, you know, let, let me just comment on what you have said on, the, on, on the sphere of influence. Uh, I, I could never comprehend this concept of uh, sphere of influence. And if you give me just one example, what country might belong to the Russian sphere of influence today? One. Is it Kazakhstan? Is it Lukashenko in Belarus? I can tell you many stories about Lukashenko and Nazarbayev, how they distance themselves from Putin in a very substantial way. So in my opinion, this concept is a little bit metaphysical, uh, if not <laughs> theological. But having said that, let me also say, you know, in my opinion, what happened to Russia, uh, trying to carve its own sphere of influence, <coughs> it's, it, is the second best option after being a part of a larger community of nations. So for Russia, uh, it was a consolation prize for what in Moscow they perceived as their failure or the failure of the West to include them as an equal and a respectful partner into the Western community of nations. Because if you roll back history and think about the attempts of Russia in the 1990s and the early, in the early 2000s, including the first years of Mr. Putin, definitely the idea was that we should we belong there. We should somehow work together with NATO and with the European Union. But allegedly, we were not granted this opportunity. And uh, if you are sitting in your you know, shining city on the wall, and you deprive us of access to this city, well, we will try to build something of our own in the valley. Maybe not as shiny, maybe not as bright as what you have, but at least it will be ours. So I think this, that explains the logic. And if you take Ukraine in particular, I think that uh, the difference, one of the major differences between the Russian position or the predominant Russian position and the position here is that uh, in Russia, the Russian operation, Russian engagement in Ukraine is perceived as a defensive action. Because the rhetoric, the narrative in the Kremlin is that there was a country in between, more or less balanced, but for this or that reason, the West decided to disrupt this very delicate balance by engaging Ukraine into this association agreement, by promoting Maidan and you know, blah, blah, blah. You, you know all this happening. So if you, uh, definitely for Putin, it would be much better to have all of Ukraine rather than to have a part of Ukraine. But I think that for him, it was uh, almost something that uh, was in force. So, and finally, let me just give you a very final statement. I think that, you know, endless hope of compromises. And I think that you, you are right. It is very difficult right now. 
And I think that both sides will have to compromise. For Russians, the first compromise that Russia has to make is to recognize that Ukraine is a separate nation, that it is not a part of a larger Russian nation, it has its own identity, it has its own right to exist. And it might sound odd after almost 30 years of independence, but many people in Moscow question this assumption. But I think for Ukraine it is equally important to recognize that the <coughs> conflict that they have in the East is at least in some way uh, also a domestic conflict. That indeed, you know, it might have been exploited by outside forces, but there are some domestic reasons for that. Ukraine is a very diverse country. You cannot impose an agenda of the Western part of the country on all of it. And what is going on in Ukraine right now, again, you know, I don't want to, uh, to, to, to sound condescending, but look at the legislation languages. That's the best way to exclude any kind of reconciliation uh, between Western Ukraine and uh, Donbass. I'm not sure that this is the right policy for Kyiv. Last question when it comes to Ukraine and Putin and Europe, Ambassador Ishinga. Um, what can, I mean, the majority of people in Germany, I guess, wants to live in peace and friendship with Russia, especially with Russia, given the long-standing relationship and so on and so forth, and the responsibility for the horrendous war. Um, what can we, especially we Germans, um, what can we do to help Russia come back to Europe? Or do we just have to face the sad reality that there is a new divide and for many, many years to come? And that it's in the very end um, the, the Russians themselves who have to find their way back to Europe. Well, let me say first uh, on a philosophical note, uh, international diplomacy is not mathematics. There may be stuff in mathematics that is categorically impossible, uh, maybe questions that are <laughs> impossible to answer. Uh, in diplomacy, nothing is impossible. <laughs> nothing is impossible. We Germans learned that stuff that we considered de facto impossible actually happened, speaking of what happened uh, in 89 and 90. So uh, in diplomacy, miracles are not impossible. And uh, we should not, and I would totally agree with Andre, that we should not accept the current state of play as inevitable and permanent and, uh, you know, sadly sort of uh, watch things unfold. We need to try to do something about it. That's what your question is about. But uh, just a couple of brief remarks. First of all, of course, what stands in the way of making this uh, effort uh, uh, easy is what um, I found out, found out the hard way. Look, it was almost to the day two years ago in November 2015 that uh, a group that I worked with presented a report which was entitled Back to Diplomacy, uh, mandated by the OSCE. And what this group, which included a Russian participant, American participant, uh, European participants, what we found out is, as we tried to come up with recommendations about your Atlantic security, mm -hmm. that what made it impossible for us then and what makes it impossible for our governments now is that we have two or actually three diametrically opposed narratives. We have a Western narrative that says, we're the good guys. We're the good guys, right? We didn't actually do anything bad. Well, maybe uh, George W. Bush did the wrong thing in invading Iraq, but you know that actually cost uh, American soldiers their lives and, and billions of dollars. So let's get over uh, it. Uh, and the Russians are the bad guys. Yeah. The Russians are saying, we've been victimized. We've been victimized in a terrible way. Uh, promises have been made. Uh, uh, not fulfilled, uh, NATO is encroaching on, uh, on Russia and we somehow needed to say stop. That, that's essentially what Putin says. And then there are countries in between like Georgia and Ukraine and, and, and a few others which, uh, who are saying, oh, 
by God, uh, we are not in NATO. We are not really on very good terms with uh, Putin. How the hell are we supposed to preserve our own security and watch out for our future? So this is this is where we are. Unfortunately, two years after this report, things haven't changed much. My first comment. Second comment. Um, you know, from a German point of view, I think post World War II German point of view, good foreign policy is, for example that you try to make all your neighbors love you or if they don't love you at least respect you and have trust in you that you will never again invade them or do other harm to them so that they can trust you we actually mm. i claim the germans were quite successful over the last half century in re-engaging with all of our neighbors including those who used to be members of the warsaw pact in uh, trying to establish this relationship. It seems to me that there are, to this day, important segments in Russian thinking, not all Russians, in, excluding those <laughs> present here tonight, uh, <laughs> who, be, <laughs> who, continue, who continue to believe that it is actually good for Russia's interests if our neighbors live in some degree of apprehension and fear of Russia. <coughs> In other words, Russia likes to be seen as the strong with these smaller neighbors. I think that is wrong in, 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 in the modern world. I think Russia could... Look, I mean, f five years ago, I would guess 90% of Ukrainians, if, if asked by a poll, would have said Russia is our big brother, neighbor, we have close relations, sometimes we have some uh, issues, but essentially, this is a, a brotherly relationship. Today, and the, I'm only adding this remark to what Andre said, today, three years uh, post, three and a half years post uh, Crimea, um, a poll would probably reveal, and there are polling data, that a large majority, a significant majority of Ukrainians regard Russia as the principal challenge, risk to the security of Ukraine and actually a kind of an Ukrainian national identity has begun to grow out of this conflict in a way that is actually detrimental to Russian interests. So in that sense, I think Russian foreign policy has been actually not successful. Uh, you spoke about the risks of the investment mm. in Syria and elsewhere. But I, it seems to me that there may be short-lived success stories here and there for Russian foreign policy. But if your assessment is correct that there is no single neighbor today of Russia who actually regards himself as part of the sphere, sphere of influence, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's actually disastrous. Uh, that's, that is the outcome of a policy that, that was seeking to dominate neighbors and not make turn them into your friends and supporters. Now, what should we do uh, on Ukraine? Uh, I have great respect and I have been good friends with Kurt Volker. I, he, I think he's an excellent diplomat. But I don't like this arrangement at all. Look, for three years now, almost three years, we've had this Normandy a group where Chancellor Merkel unsuccessfully with a uh, succession of French presidents has been sitting with President Putin and President Poroshenko not getting anywhere at all, unfortunately. And I, I'm not criticizing Chancellor Merkel. I have great admiration for her patience and persistence and unwavering you know, activity, she keeps calling Putin on the phone, even though nothing is moving forward. So she deserves actually to be applauded for the, the effort, but it has not led anywhere. Why has it not led anywhere? Well, first of all, because the Russians uh, are difficult negotiators here. And secondly, because I think the format is not right. I think, quite frankly, if I were Putin, or an advisor to Putin, I would say, if we Russians are interested in a settlement of this Donbass issue, 
we need to have some indication what NATO is, is, is interested in doing with and about Ukraine in the future. And from a Russian point of view, the so-called NATO question is not a question decided in Berlin or in Paris, but it is seen as a question primarily decided in Washington, D.C. So I think the Russian leadership correctly would like to see um, the uh, American signature or imprint on any arrangement. In other words, I think the absence of America from the um, diplomatic uh, arrangement here is detrimental to our interests and detrimental to the achievement as a settlement. I want Kurt Volker at the, at the Minsk table, and uh, even if that sounds contra, uh, counterintuitive, I would actually want Mr. Trump present when, even though he probably doesn't even know where Lugansk and Donetsk are, <laughs> but I would want him at the table when, the, when this is discussed at that level. Why? Because I think it would have a disciplining uh, uh, effect mm -hmm. on yes, what he thinks and uh, etc. If he were part of this thing, uh, rather than sitting in Washington and considering the delivery of lethal or non-lethal weapons to Ukraine without ever having been exposed in a detail to a detailed discussion about it, and um, and I think that. This would also be good for our relationship with Russia, if we had, if you know, I think this would be a return to the classic contact group, mm -hmm. which your and our friend Igor Ivanov and mm -hmm. I participated in in the effort to end the war in the Balkans. Mm -hmm. If Russia were an equal, were a party equal mm -hmm. to the U.S. in such an uh, arrangement, we would at least have a chance to start rebuilding a little bit of trust in such an arrangement. You see why, why he's such a wonderful diplomat, because he not only believes that miracles can happen, he, yes, he makes them happen <laughs> in a certain way. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been heavy stuff huh? now for almost two hours. You have been sitting and listening patiently and with interest, and um, apparently there's lots of more questions to be asked and lots and lots and more answers to be um, to be found. What I learned from tonight, just very small points. First of all, we need to look at things incrementally. There's only very small steps we can take at a time to, at some <coughs> point, some when, somehow, uh, find a new common ground. The second point that I take is that we, as civil societies and as democratic societies, that we need to engage in this discussion way more um, than apparently we, we used um, to do for many, many years. And um, the third and last point I take away is miracles are possible and actually once in a while they are happening. So um, with this um, hopefully optimistic point let's conclude for tonight and thank you so much for your patience. I think there is wine, vodka, uh, whatever, um, <laughs> double whiskeys um, out there. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you. <laughs>